I think that the sixth generation of fighters will stand out for their performances. There's something more important going on. We have already discussed the importance of classifying combat aircraft in generations, and we already said that they are mostly irrelevant. The only real historical discontinuity has been the generalized adoption of stealth that was unexpected, but everything else we have now has roots in the Cold War. Every technology that today is mainstream is the end point of an evolution started decades ago. But for the sixth generation, maybe it's going to be different. Sure, the aircraft will be outstanding, but that won't be the end of it. I personally believe that the most relevant feature of the sixth generation will be the breaking of the technology stalemate we are in. Have you ever heard of the Augustine's Laws? Well, if you did, you already know where I'm going, but if you don't, well, Otis? Augustine's Laws are a series of what humans define tongue-in-cheek aphorisms. They have been published by Norman Augustine, an American aerospace executive, in a 1984 book. Exactly, Otis. And what does Law 16 say? In the year 2054, the entire defense budget will purchase just one aircraft. This aircraft will have to be shared by the Air Force and Navy 3 one stroke two days each per week except for leap year, when it will be made available to the Marines for the extra day. So, this is a joke, but the problem does exist. Combat aircraft have become more and more complex and sophisticated. The costs have increased and the numbers have decreased, and the airframe lifetime has expanded to unprecedented levels. Some may say that the effectiveness has increased too, and the same mission can be executed by fewer aircraft, and while this is true, everybody is increasing the complexity and reducing the numbers of basically everything. So there are fewer targets and they are better protected. With fewer aircraft, losses become less and less acceptable and responsibility gets concentrated in fewer hands. With longer airframe lifetimes, errors are more difficult to fix, updates are more difficult to implement, and reacting to unforeseen circumstances is more difficult as well. So somehow it was clear that this vicious cycle had to be broken and some brilliant minds have found different solutions. Saab started with the grip and MG. The idea was to isolate software components and having them communicate with each other with standardized interfaces. And the idea isn't particularly brilliant in itself. It had been used in IT since, well, forever. But nobody really made any effort to implement it in a fighter jet till about the early 2000s. Even relatively modern aircraft like the F-22 or the Eurofighter Typhoon have been designed with ad hoc monolithic software. Swapping in and out components or integrating new weapons on these platforms is a complex and delicate process. On the grip and integrating a new system or a new weapon is sort of like installing a new application on a computer. Few updates are needed to the rest of the software and crucially none to the flight software. The testing process, which is expensive and time-consuming because it normally requires hundreds of hours of simulation and flight, is drastically simplified. In fact, the Gripen was chosen for the development of the Meteor exactly because the integration was much simpler and the missiles developers could iterate much more quickly. Today, open and modular architectures are becoming a must. The F-18 EF Block III implements modular elements according to the US DoD standards. The B-21 software has been built to be highly modular as well, and this is probably one of the reasons why the development of the aircraft has been relatively quick and devoid of big issues so far. And the F-35 tried to implement the same thing, but with less success, at least judging from the endless software problems that required a very long time to be fixed. The sixth generation fighters, though, will be the first to be built natively according to this paradigm. For example, in parallel with the development of the Tempest, the UK MOD has launched the Pyramid Initiative with the objective of defining standards for interoperable and reusable software. The idea is somewhat similar to computer hardware drivers. For example, a missile will come with its own drivers and every pyramid-compatible platform will just need to install them to make use of the weapon. 
some hardware compatibility and weapons release tests will always be needed. But the most delicate and time-consuming part is no longer necessary. So, shorter time means lower costs, and lower costs mean potentially more platforms. So, a, a few years ago, the United States Air Force flaunted an idea that I find similar to agile project management. Those working in IT will be familiar with this. So, rather than spending 25 years developing a radically new aircraft with superior performances, why we don't develop incrementally, releasing a new iteration every, say, five years? Every iteration may not be a fully-fledged multi-role platform. One may be focused on electronic warfare, another on ISR. There may be an air-to-air -air version, a missile track, a bomb track, and so on. So each iteration will incrementally deliver a simpler platform, easier to develop, less expensive, and less resource-intensive. There are some enabling technologies that require to do so, but the concept in itself should bring a variety and a versatility that hasn't been seen since the 60s. Uh, now, I have some doubts that the Air Force and the Navy and GAD projects have taken this path. Recent news about the numbers that are going to be acquired and the project timelines are more typical of a program based on a big design upfront approach. I suppose we'll see. Nonetheless, the idea remains valid and it has a lot of potential to increase the number and the affordability of the platforms. Call it Loyal Wingman, Skyborg or Remote Carrier. Capability to operate together with autonomous drones is one of the staples of the sixth generation. This is not a capability that couldn't be implemented on previous generation aircraft, but all the sixth generation programs do include some form of a robotic sidekick as an integral part of the program. It is still early to say how exactly these will be used, uh, and I suspect that autonomous flying in conjunction with the piloted platform will be the most difficult element to develop in the entire program. These drones may provide additional sensors, and particularly passive sensors would be very attractive, or they could provide additional weapons, either kinetic or non-kinetic. Sir, my research indicates that the term weapon is obsolete, and it has been replaced by a vector. Okay, thank you, Otis. And they also could be tankers, or even be used as intelligent cruise missiles for high pain targets. It seems that the general consensus is to operate with two unmanned platforms for each manned one. But there is another concept that is relevant in our context. Some of these will be attritable. That is, they will be considered cheap and simple enough to be sacrificed if necessary. These attritable drones will be potentially even more important than the high-end versions that would be basically a smaller version of the manned platform. In fact, in this way, it will be possible to accept losses once again. and robotic losses in this case. It may seem bizarre, but this will fix one of the main issues that high-end platforms are having even now, and it will be only worse with the sixth generation. What I mean with this? Well, a single F-22 or F-35 down by enemy fire will utterly destroy their reputation. The military know very well that this may happen, but the outrage in the public opinion will be massive. The government's reaction may lead to less than optimal decisions. Fifth generation and sixth generation aircraft are being sold to the public opinion as quantum leaps. The outrageous costs associated with these programs are accepted only because the public is assured of their total superiority. So, each loss may be politically fatal. With the treatable platforms that could be built in relatively large numbers, the kind of mission too dangerous for the fifth or the sixth generation aircraft will likely become possible again. And then there is someone who tackles the problem head-on. The flip side of design complexity 
is building complexity. Supply chains for modern fighters jets have very, very long lead times. For some components, it is measured in years, and they also include a surprisingly high number of manual passages. But the sixth generation is likely changing all of this. For example, Bai System has created in its Wharton plant a production facility for the Tempest that is little short of science fiction. Biovision is a completely connected end-to-end -end environment from requirements, engineering, supply chains, production systems to support upgrades and enhancement. Some of the capabilities are just scaling of existing concepts like additive manufacturing. 3D printers are very common today, even for the hobbyists, and an increasing percentage of industrial products do use additive manufacturing. In Wharton, though, there are printers capable of printing meters-long metal pieces. Bai is using these technologies in the current product lineup too. For example, the typhoons provided to Qatar include 3D printed large structural pieces. Other capabilities just enhance human performance. Smart assembly benches integrate small robots that help the operator who is wearing augmented reality goggles. These provide cues to the human and they can be reconfigured in no time for the assembly of different subcomponents. The Wharton plant also features robots derived from the automotive industry whose precision has been increased to match the tolerances required by modern aeronautic industry. For example, the length tolerance of the typhoon from the tip of the radum to the end of the tail is about a millimeter. And the same robots do not require human intervention to change the tools so they can execute multiple tasks in the same position. And for what can be executed in a single position, some of them move around. All this automation is controlled by a central control room, and the data generated by the shop floor equipment seamlessly flow to the knowledge workers in the office. The objective? While the lead time of some typhoon parts is four years, Biosystem is aiming to reduce it to 100 days. The Tempest production is expected to be much quicker and crucially cheaper than any other aircraft before. And Bai is obviously not the only one moving in this direction. Lockheed Martin has a similar initiative. Saab is doing the same. Suhoi is moving in the same direction, albeit it started late. And we can only assume that the Chinese, who always had a particular focus on industrial automation, are doing the same. So this is what I think is going to be the discontinuity with the sixth generation. Numbers will come back, albeit in a different form, because quantity has a quality of its own, and even better when the quantity has some quality. I don't think that this sentence has a meaning in any human language, sir. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for watching this video and an even bigger thank you to all those who are supporting the channel by one of donations on PayPal, on Patreon or by becoming members. You can also support the channel by buying a model from Air Models. There is an affiliate link below. I will have a small percentage and there will be no extra cost for you. This is not the first video about the sixth generation fighters on the channel and if you are interested, please click on the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, Thank you very much for getting this far and see you next time.